right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. I want to say a special shout out to Howlett Academy, joining us live in the background. Hello, guys. And then, of course, all our friends on YouTube from Milton, London, all over Ontario and beyond. We had, I think, 35 classrooms registered for today's program, and it is so exciting that you guys are as excited as I am about urban biodiversity, wildlife, in the city. And so we're going to dive in in a minute with Kat Lucas joining us from Ontario Streams. Now Ontario Streams is all about protecting and showcasing the magic of wetlands, uh, streams, rivers, amazing water bodies teeming with life, uh, including in some of our biggest urban centers. Today we're going to dive in on a program that holds a special place in my heart because it's in a place that I visited a lot as a boy. Now again, most people when they think of wildlife think of places like Banff, Algonquin Park, Brazil, Serengeti. And what I always love to highlight in these programs is that there's so much close to home. If you guys walk into your schoolyards, backyards, close to home, there's so much nature to be discovered. And so Kat is joining us today from Etienne Brule Park, a place that I have visited for my entire life, to talk about the salmon run. We are going to learn about all the amazing fish that you can find in these streams uh, during a really special time of year here in October. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kat to blow our minds, and then we'll dive in with Q&A at the end. So Kat, I'll turn it to you, kick us away, Hi, and go for it. I'm Kat, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Ontario Streams. And Ontario Streams is a non-profit environmental charity based out of the north end of the Greater Toronto Area. Our mission is to promote the protection and rehabilitation of Ontario streams, rivers, and wetlands through community action and education. All of that means that we love to help rivers out right here in the Greater Toronto Area, and also do lots of education and outreach with students such as you. Today though, I am here at Etienne Brule Park in Toronto, and behind me, either way, this is a little bit backwards, but behind me is Humber River. Today I am on the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and many bands of Chippewa. Indigenous peoples were the first stewards of the land, the first caretakers of the environment. And today, hopefully you'll learn something new about the local environment and the wildlife here, which will inspire you to be a caretaker of the environment as well. Humber River is designated a Canadian Heritage River. That means that it holds a lot of cultural and recreational value here. The Humber River is one of nine big rivers that run throughout the greater Toronto area and it has many little branches and offshoots as well. It is actually the largest of the nine rivers here in the greater Toronto area, stretching all the way from Orangevale down to Lake Ontario. In terms of its cultural significance, the Humber River is called the Carrying Place Trail and it held a lot of value as a transportation route. Back in the day, uh, whether it's Indigenous peoples or our first settlers here in Canada, riverways and other waterways were super, super important for getting around. When you think about it, either we'd be walking around through the forest, and that would take a very long time, or you could hop in a boat and travel very easily along a river. The Humber River is actually one of the oldest transportation routes here in Canada. And rivers and waterways and, and water systems as a whole also offer a lot of uh, other benefits as well in addition to transportation. Uh, and our river systems, waterways, they offer food as well, whether it's for us humans or for wildlife here. In the Great Lakes region, we have over 140 different kinds of fish. But today we are focusing on one kind of fish. Uh, as you may have seen in the title, we're talking about salmon in the city. And the group that salmon belong to is called Salmonids. That's kind of a funny big name, but it's just like the big family of fish that look kind of like salmon. It features trout, salmon, and cisco and whitefish. Those are all part of the same big Salmonid family. And salmon, we talk a lot about at this time of year because this is one time of year, the spring and the fall, when salmon migrate. So here uh, we've got part of the Humber River, and so far today 
I have not seen any migrating salmon. But I am hoping that Jesse can be like blues clues for me. And if we do happen to see anybody start to hop, Jesse will let me know. Uh, so we don't miss any action since I am not going to stare behind me the whole time. That won't be too exciting. <laughs> but salmon, especially one special kind of salmon that we have here in Lake Ontario is called the Atlantic salmon. Now maybe you're saying, hey, I know where the Atlantic Ocean is and it's nowhere near right here. <laughs> you would be right. Uh, but there is a special subpopulation of Atlantic salmon that used to live right here in Lake Ontario. We call them the landlocked Atlantic salmon population. The Atlantic salmon that we know live out in, um, in our east coast, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, all of that. Lots of Atlantic salmon over there, of course. However, our special landlocked population here in Lake Ontario is considered locally extinct. And the big word there, or that term is extirpated. And that just means that the salmon used to live here. However, we don't find them here anymore. But of course, many of us eat Atlantic salmon, so we know that those populations way out on our east coast are still okay. They are not endangered, unlike the ones that we have here. And you might be wondering, what happened to those salmon that we used to have right here in Lake Ontario? Well, about 200, 150 years ago, when our first settlers came in, they came to Lake Ontario and they said, wow, look at all of those Atlantic salmon. And they very quickly fished those salmon down to nothing. This was also in addition to so much development and industrialization that happened at the time, where the quality of our rivers and waterways started to not do so well. And unfortunately, for the past 100 or so years, we have not seen any real big numbers of Atlantic salmon left here in Lake Ontario. There are lots of projects going on to try and bring them back, but I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes. Right now, let's look at those salmon. Part of their life cycle, of course, is this migration, but let's, let's look at what happens before then. I've got some photos to show you. Let's see. So, two starts salmon, like most fish, begin their life as an egg. So we've got our eggs right there and we can see life sized. They're about the size of a little green pea or if you've ever played with Orbeez, they look a lot like those orange or red Orbeez. The next stage of their life is called an eyed egg and we see their eye has already started to develop even though they're still in that tiny little egg. From there, after a few months or so, uh, after being fertilized, the eggs will start to hatch and we will get to start to see some Alvin, kind of like Alvin and the chipmunks. And again, life size, just about as long as my fingernail, just about a centimeter long. This little Alvin, they are just teeny tiny babies. And they are way too scared and small to go catch their own food. Just like a human baby, right? We can't make our own dinner. We need somebody to help us out. But in this case, the salmon and most fish, they don't have parents to make them dinner. Uh, and maybe you've seen the movie Finding Nemo, right? And Marlin, Nemo's dad, was so worried about trying to find Nemo. In real life, Nemo's dad would say, see you later and not worry about poor Nemo but we're happy that movie happened. It was a feel good movie. But of course, in real life here with our salmon, they have to have something to help them when they're just babies. And in this case, they have this big orange blob right on their front. And this is called a yolk sac, kind of like a built-in fridge. So they've got all of their nutrients, everything they need for about the first six months packed into this yolk sac to help them uh, they, they're able to just kind of chillax and hang out in the river, not worry about being eaten by somebody else if they had to go catch their own food. So this is really helpful for them. After that first six months though, that's all fully absorbed into their body and now they're ready to catch their own food. So here we have a fry and this guy, oops, it's all backwards. 
right here we've got again life size only about an inch long or so and like i said this is at about six months old this is when they're ready to go catch their own food they're a little bigger a little bit stronger ready to go. from there they are going to keep eating and keep growing for the next several years uh, next up we've got par and they're about six inches or so long and par is also the name of the patterns and markings that these fish have so this is like getting into a preteen kind of stage next up we do have the teenager of the salmon world which is the smolt and this here is life size about a foot long and at this point the teenager is ready to leave home this is when they'll begin their migration they say i'm off to ocean university ocean college ocean apprenticeship ocean whatever my path is and this is when they'll say see ya and they'll start swimming away from those rivers where they started their life so like our salmon that we find in the ocean whether it's the atlantic or pacific they start their life in fresh water then they head out to the salt water and that will be where they grow the salmon that we have here in lake ontario they use of course the lake as their ocean and that ocean is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. They go out there and they start to eat lots and grow very fast. Uh, and from there, they'll spend the next couple years of their life, maybe up to five, seven years of their life, hanging out in that bigger body of water and growing. Finally, when they are a full-size adult, and this is only a quarter of the scale, so they'll grow almost three feet long in some cases, and these guys here are now ready to return to these rivers. So they'll start swimming upstream from Lake Ontario and they'll keep going until they find the perfect spot to lay their eggs. And for Atlantic salmon, they are looking for something called a red. That's red with two Ds. And basically that's an area of the river where it's got a lot of rocks and a lot of gravel. And that helps the female fish, the mom fish, basically rubs around on the bottom of the river and it helps push the eggs out where then the male fish, the dad fish, will fertilize those eggs and then we are right back to the start of that life cycle. So something very interesting though that uh, we are able to appreciate for our landlocked Atlantic salmon is that their migration is much shorter than the ones going all the way to the ocean. For a Pacific salmon, they might swim up to 3,000 kilometers when they migrate. That's about driving halfway across Canada. That is a very, very long migration, and they are just exhausted by the end of that. And they end up laying their eggs, fertilizing the eggs, and then ending their life cycle there. However, with our salmon right here in Lake Ontario, they don't have a very long migration in comparison. One Atlantic salmon might swim only 30 to 50 kilometers, right? Thinking just from Lake Ontario up to Brampton, that's not very far. So that's a, a really big benefit that they have is that they're not totally exhausted after they migrate. They're able to actually um, uh, lay their eggs, spawn, and then return back to the Lake Ontario where they'll hang out until their next spawning season. And they might be able to spawn multiple times. Uh, so that is a really cool, special um, feature of our Atlantic salmon here in Lake Ontario. So, I did start by saying that our Lake Ontario Atlantic salmon, they are considered locally extinct, right? They used to be here and they're not anymore. But there is a lot of work going on to try and bring back our Atlantic salmon. One big project that Ontario Streams is a part of is the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program. What a mouthful. Uh, but that program has been around for about 15 years and the goal is to have a self-sustaining population of Atlantic salmon back here in Lake Ontario. That just means that we will have enough adult Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario that we don't have to help anymore. We don't need to interfere. The salmon can handle it all on their own and keep their population up without us introducing more and more Atlantic salmon. The good news is that we are on our way to, to achieving that goal, probably in the next 10 years or so. And we work collaboratively with the provincial government, conservation authorities, 
uh, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and the Toronto Zoo, and many other partners on this project. And a few of the things that Ontario Streams does to contribute is we will actually raise Atlantic salmon and release them out into our local waterways. So one thing we do is called in-stream incubation, which is when we put the salmon eggs into basically a PVC tube and they're nice and snug in there and they are able to be protected while they hatch and grow for their first six months of their life. In that first six months, like we said, it's really scary out there for a little baby fish. They can be eaten by somebody else. They can have some, some wonky things happen if it gets too hot or too cold. They might not like that. They might not know how to survive that. So by helping them, storing them and, and keeping them safe in these tubes, while they get through that first six months is super helpful. In the wild, about 90% of Atlantic salmon won't make it through that first six months. So by putting them in the tubes, we're bringing them much higher uh, survival rates there. Uh, over 50% at least are surviving that first uh, six months in those tubes. This past year, we released almost 11,000 baby Atlantic salmon uh, through our program. So that's really great news. And as the program as a whole, we're looking at hundreds of thousands every year of Atlantic salmon are being released into our local water. So we've got some really good things happening. Another thing that we have to do, of course, though, is to help fix our rivers. It's not going to be all that helpful to be putting lots of baby salmon out into our rivers if the rivers aren't really healthy uh, as a habitat for these animals. So at Ontario Streams, we are often helping fix up the rivers by trying to reduce erosion. And erosion is something that happens when after a big rainfall, all the water falls onto our cities. We've got lots of pavement, driveways, all of that, where the water just runs down and into our sewers. A lot of people don't know, but our sewers are connected to our natural waterways. So the water that goes off of our streets goes right into our rivers. Now, after that big rain, the water is, there's a lot of water and it's moving very fast. And it's moving so fast, it's like a pressure washer. And it's just carving out the rivers uh, and their river banks. And when that happens, all of that sand and soil that was in on those river banks ends up inside the, the river, where it then becomes kind of murky. Maybe you've seen the river looking kind of like chocolate milk, not so yummy. Uh, and for our fish like salmon, they rely so much on their eyesight to catch their prey. So if all of a sudden it's like chocolate milk, they can't see anything, unfortunately, they're probably going to go hungry if they can't catch their prey. So by uh, coming in here and fixing the streams, what we do is we will take dead trees and limbs and we will branches and we will actually put them along the riverbank and all of those little branches, they create little hidey holes for that soil and sand to then rest in there and fill out that bank again and make sure that that water runs clean and clear. Another thing we do is we take out blockages in the rivers. Again, sometimes after these big rainstorms, we have all of that water flowing through and it picks up logs and branches and twigs and all of those twigs and branches and logs can sometimes make a big clog or blockage in the river. And our salmon here, as they are moving through the river, they want to get through. Uh, and those kind of blockages can sometimes be in the way for salmon and other fish. So we will actually come and, and pull those open and make sure the salmon can get through. However, maybe you're wondering, what about this thing behind you, Kat? How's that different than a little block and pull of twigs? Well, this here is called a weir, and it's a, a kind of dam. And it's a pretty small, and it helps control the water, water flow through our urban systems. And actually, a salmon is a very good jumper. Uh, so a salmon can jump over this kind of structure. However, we are working to try and, and reduce the number of these so that our salmon can get through the rivers a little bit easier. And lastly, another important thing for us to do is education. Uh, so that's why I'm out here today letting you know about how important it is to protect our Atlantic salmon and other wildlife that we have here in Toronto. But that's what we do at Ontario Streams. Maybe you're thinking, what can I do? I can't go fix all the rivers. But don't worry, there's things you can do at home too. 
one thing you can do is to save water. Uh, and that means just turning off the taps when we're not using them, making sure that we are not just letting the water run. I do have a class out here joining me now. Uh, so if you see some people running around in the background, we've got lots of spectators here looking for these salmon. Another thing we can do is to try and uh, not litter, right? If we make garbage, we make sure it gets in the garbage bin. Another thing, of course, is to reduce, reuse, recycle. We know those three R's. We love those three R's. And something that we can do on a larger, more global scale is to think about where we are getting the fish that we eat. The next time you're at the grocery store, you can pull up something called the Seafood Watch Guide that's run by the Monterey Bay Aquarium or OceanWise, which is run by the Vancouver Aquarium. And both of those resources have an online platform that lets you uh, do some quick research about the seafood that you're about to buy at the grocery store and try to make some better choices to get more sustainably harvested seafood. Lastly, probably the easiest thing you can do today is to share what you've learned with someone new. You can let them know how important our, our rivers here in Toronto are, how important our local fish are, and how important it is to just protect the environment as a whole. So I hope that you've learned something new that you're able to share with someone else. And I am very happy to start taking some questions now. Uh, as Jesse, I'm sure mentioned, I, I can't hear him today, so we'll be relying on that chat for him to share with me. Fantastic. Kat, what a great time. Thank you so, so much for that. It's our first program we've ever had with both, with both a waterfall and an entire class photobombing in the background. So thank you for the unique uh, opportunity today. Uh, as Kat mentioned, I didn't mention this at the top, but yes, uh, we can hear her and you guys can hear me, which is great, but she can't actually hear me right now. So what we're going to do is the live classes, I'll come to you guys. You can share questions and I'll put them in a little bit of a chat and I'll be taking questions from our seven plus YouTube groups and putting them up on screen so that Kat can see. So Howell Academy 2J, if you guys want to unmute your mics and get ready for a minute uh, with some questions, I'll give you a second to let those thoughts come uh, together, and I'll share one of our questions on YouTube with Kat. So Ms. Galbraith's class is run through welcome and guys. All right, flipped us what around. Do you, what do you want to highlight? Uh, well, keep an eye on the chat. Main what predators? are salmon's main predators? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, in the wild, salmon are often called the king of the fish because they are generally the top predators in their food chains. Uh, however, of course, many humans eat salmon, uh, as well as large birds of prey. They'll come down and scoop up some salmon. Uh, of course, in the Pacific Ocean, we often hear a lot more about bears, uh, but not here in Lake Ontario. You, we don't have to worry about bears eating the salmon here as often. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Let me take another quick one from YouTube. Uh, Howlett, I'll bring you guys in live. So if you want to share a question live on camera, Hello, Howlett Academy. Nice to meet you guys. Hi. 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 Do you have a question for Kat that I can share with her today? Uh, um, uh, mm. How long do salmon live up to? How long do salmon live? Yes. Perfect. Let me bring it up on the screen for her again. She's having a little trouble hearing me today, so we're we're having some exciting uh, moments together. How long do salmon live? I'm going to put up everything you guys ask uh, in the chat for Kat to check out. All right, there we go. How long do salmon live? You should get that. How long do salmon live? Uh, so a salmon might live somewhere around 10 years or so, and they will spend that first couple of years living in the rivers, and then they'll spend the next three to maybe seven years living out in uh, their bigger body of water. And then, yeah, around 10 years old or so is when they'll, they'll start their migration coming back. Uh, and they, <laughs> our, our Atlantic salmon here at Lake Ontario, like I said, they don't necessarily die after they migrate and spawn. Uh, so they might live even a little bit longer than that. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. All right. Actually, a quick note. It will be a lot easier and you'll avoid me having to type so much. Uh, if teachers in 2J and Howlett, if you guys are willing to use the chat bar on the side of the screen to share your questions there, that'll make this go a little bit faster. I will come to you guys. You can do a bit of a shout out too, of course. But for the time being, let me take a few questions from YouTube. Uh, Ms. Morris' class, what do salmon eat in Ontario rivers? All right. I see one asking, what do salmon eat in Lake Ontario rivers? Uh, well, they when they're small, they'll likely eat smaller, uh, smaller things that they find, uh, whether that's things like plankton and whatnot. Uh, and then as they grow older, they will start switching to smaller fish. And then, of course, when they're nice and big, uh, they'll be eating a lot of the bigger fish that we might find here in Lake Ontario. Perfect. All right. Let me take another one from YouTube. Uh, Miss Rowan's class. 
how do the salmon jump up to swim the waterfall? Uh, well, salmon, they are, are very good at jumping, like I said. Uh, they can easily jump over a meter. Uh, but as you can see on this weir here, it's actually little steps. So about every foot or so, there's a step. Uh, and that makes it a little bit easier for the salmon to jump up. In some cases, there might not be these steps, which does make it a little bit harder. And that's why we are focusing on trying to reduce the barriers here uh, to the salmon migration. Very cool. I absolutely love that part. It's always been one of my very favorite places. Let me take a question from Mr. Mayotte's class. I Welcome in, guys. The other chat. How much do salmon weigh when they are full grown? Perfect. And, or I don't know, maybe just no, that's answered good. that. Um, well, they, they can be, oh, we're all good. <laughs> they can be um, quite a few pounds. I, I can't remember off the top of my head here, uh, but they, they do grow to be about three feet long. Uh, and I don't know for sure how much they weigh. That might be a question for Google afterwards. <laughs> Perfect. Let me bring up one on YouTube. And I see another one about asking about overfishing in the Great Lakes and Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario, because they are considered a species at risk. They are considered locally extinct. It is illegal to catch and take an Atlantic salmon that you might find here in Lake Ontario. Uh, so really, um, you can catch and release. Of course, that's uh, easy and, and uh, conservation minded to do that. Uh, and it would be illegal to catch and actually take an Atlantic salmon for dinner. Uh, however, back in uh, two, 200 years ago or so, the overfishing is essentially uh, what really affected the population of Atlantics here, here in Lake Ontario. Perfect. All right. Let's take a question from Ms. Rowan's class. There we go. All right. We see how many types of salmon are there. That's a great question. Uh, here in Lake Ontario, in the Great Lakes, of the, the salmonids that we have here, the ones that we think that are typically are, are salmon and trout, we have about eight different kinds of salmon and trout, including our coho, chinook, rainbow trout, uh, those ones are all non-native, but they are introduced and in here in Lake Ontario. Uh, our native species of salmonids would be our Atlantic salmon, um, brook trout, and lake trout. Right. Awesome. Oh, let's take that question from Mr. Mayotte's class now. How far does it last and how far upstream do how they go? How long does salmon migration last and how far upstream do they go? Uh, so that is a really great question. We are really kind of on the tail fin, tail end of the salmon migration right now, the fall salmon migration. So that's kind of why we're not seeing a whole lot of action today. Uh, usually they start a little bit earlier in September. So it usually does last a few weeks that we'll be able to see them actively moving through here. Uh, and I forget what the second half of that question was. <laughs> you mind putting that back up? How far upstream do they go? Thank you, Jesse. Uh, they will, like I said, here in, uh, in on the greater Toronto area, uh, they can go uh, like past Brampton. So we're looking at maybe 50 kilometers or so, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and of course the salmon are, are moving all through our, our nine big rivers here in the greater Toronto area. So Brampton is just one example, but they are moving all the way across from basically Etobicoke all the way to Ajax. Awesome. A and great, oh, great follow-up question for that is below. So. Where else can we, Where find, can we find salmon in Ontario? Uh, so they are common right here in Lake Ontario, but we'll also find them in the other Great Lakes too. There are salmon basically, I believe in all five of our Great Lakes. So they're not uh, too hard to find. How many eggs can a salmon hatch at once? Another great question. One adult female could lay somewhere between 250 to 300, maybe even a little bit more eggs at a time. So that is a, a lot of eggs for sure coming. <laughs> All right, I like this question on color from Miss Rowan's class. Ooh, what, what colors like? are the Atlantic salmon? That's a great question. And uh, color and, and patterns are usually how we're able to tell different kinds of salmonids apart. For the Atlantic salmon, they are a silvery color with black dots on them. Uh, so that's kind of how we tell them apart from others, but it can be really tricky to tell salmon and trout apart, uh, especially if we had seen any today, I would not be able to tell you what they are uh, without getting up close. <laughs> yeah. I love this question from Ms. Morris's class. Uh, just sort of highlight something. Uh, you already talked about this being the end of the season, but uh, can you answer that one? If there's any yeah, others salmon, that come up? Uh, and trout, they will either spawn and migrate during the spring or the fall. So it just depends on which fish uh, to, to, to know what time of year they will spawn. 
All right, let me share a question of my own. Can the kids here today get try to raise? Let's see if we can get that up on the banner for uh, Pat. Can we raise our own Santa? Can the kids here get try? <laughs> we would love to grow our program at the at Ontario Streams. We really have a just a few classrooms that we work with to grow Atlantic salmon. However, the Toronto Zoo has a, a bigger program as well. Uh, and you can check out their website for more info on their program called Awful Links, as well as the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. They have the largest of our classroom hatchery programs that they run. So if uh, you're looking for some, uh, some more information, their website has a lot too. And that's the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program. Uh, their website has all the details uh, with all of that information about the larger program and the smaller classroom hatchery programs as well. Fantastic. All right, one more question from Howlett Academy. I'll bring you guys back in to say hi while it's on screen. There we go. Oh, let's bring up, let's bring up your question. How long can salmon go without food? <laughs> one more, Pat. <laughs> oh, did you see the question? One more. One more question I see. How long yes. can salmon go without food? Uh, so really it's going to be that first six months where they won't eat in the way that we think about eating. They're not going uh, to catch anything to eat. They're just relying solely on their yolk sac, that built-in fridge. Uh, so for that first six months, they're not really eating. Uh, after that, as adults, they, they really love to eat. Uh, so they will keep eating. And I think often during the migration, at least for, for many fish, they won't eat during that migration. So they'll eat a lot and then they will save up all of their energy and then they will go and swim and swim until they are ready to find that perfect spot, uh, that red to lay their eggs. Uh, and then from then they will go back to eating. Very, very cool, Pat. We've got two more questions. Two, two more, more questions. questions. Yep. Perfect. All right. Uh, Mr. Moore's last song you want to know. How big was the overall salmon population before they were at risk? Wow, that is a great question that I don't know off the top of my head. But they talk about, uh, like in these, these historic reports, like you could just basically grab a net and scoop and you would get sam catch salmon. And there's lots of uh, archive photographs of these boats just being full to the brim of salmon. People can't even walk around on the decks because they are just so full. So I'm not sure about numbers, but there were a lot. And uh, that's a good point too, is that Salmon were, are, were and are considered a symbol of abundance in many Indigenous cultures. Uh, so for something that symbolized so much, so much, to then go down to absolutely nothing, it, it's a cultural loss in addition to an environmental loss. Yeah, I'm really, really glad you mentioned that, Kat. It's such an important message. And again, next week we're doing our Secret Path Week. So if people want to learn more about Indigenous cultures and stories like that, uh, do check us out. We've got a whole bunch on the go. It should be a really fantastic celebration. All right, our final question, Mr. Mayotte's class, male and female salmon. Are there any identifiable differences between males and female salmon? That's another great question. And until they are adults, uh, there's no real way to tell the difference. Uh, they look pretty much the exact same. However, when they are ready to start their family, ready to spawn, that's when we start to see them starting to develop special features. The males will often get uh, a little bit more uh, color to them as well as we'll start to see them develop a little hook on their nose. Uh, so you may have seen some pictures and even, let's see, I can go back to my notes here because we do have this picture where you can see that the male is on the top there and they have that, that much more uh, distinct nose and mouth shape there uh, compared to the female, which is on the bottom. So those are the big features that uh, will appear when they're ready to spawn. Very, very cool. Kat, this is so, so much fun. I, I know you can't see what I'm, or hear what I'm saying, but thanks to everyone and the Kat. What an amazing program. Again, so nice to be out by the waterfall in such a beautiful park. And such great questions from all our classes today. So live classes, Howler 2J, thank you guys so much. All our friends on YouTube. Kat, that was fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. We'll bring you to say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful